Well, what really happened to Malaysian Airlines Flight MH370? 10 years ago, Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 disappeared on radar March 8th, 2014, while flying from Kuala Lumpur International Airport in Malaysia to its planned destination in Beijing. Of course, it never arrived. There were 227 passengers on board, 12 crew members at the time. It's un hard to believe to my brain that 10 years have now passed and we might finally have some pieces of information, some leads as to what caused this disappearance. Ashton Forbes is a citizen investigative uh, journalist, has in many ways devoted his life to figuring out what happened here. And we decided to invite Ashton on the show to present some of this new evidence, provide some context. And it seems like for a lot of us, maybe this is a story that has just disappeared from our own collective memories. Ashton, welcome to the show. Thank you, Clayton, for having me. I'm happy to be here today. Well, thrilled to have you. And it's just hard to believe that it's been 10 years. And I remember it was a Saturday morning for me in the United States. And we were just going on the air on Fox News. Uh, I did the, the weekend show, Fox and Friends. And my co-host at the time, Tucker Carlson, we were in the green room. We were getting coffee. We're having we we're pre preparing for the show. And we couldn't believe that this story had happened. Well, at Fox News Alert, we now know missing Malaysia Flight 370 was deliberately diverted. And today, the investigation turned to the crew and passengers aboard that plane. All right, we're back now with the Fox News Alert. Investigators are moving the search for that missing airplane from, land, uh, from sea to land, some uninhabited islands. The search begins with these some hundreds of islands off the Adaman and Nicobar Islands. How could this thing have evaded the radar? I mean, we have, tel we have stealth aircraft for just such an occasion, but you're saying there's no radar out there anyway. It's one of those stories that he and I still communicate about many, many years later. And it's an unbelievable story. And we knew at the time something seemed really fishy about the whole thing. This was not just a lost craft. Something deeper was going on here. I'm curious, before we get into the nitty gritty, it compelled me to be so fascinated about this story. What compelled you about this story to really dive so deeply into this? I think I had a similar experience that you did uh, 10 years ago. I've always been interested in uh, plane incidents in general because I've had a fear of flying my whole life, even though I've done it a lot for my job. And the MH370 situation was very unusual. You could tell right away there was a lot of obfuscation over what was happening. When a plane goes missing, you would think that the information would be made publicly available right off the bat, especially if there was a chance there might be people on a raft somewhere in the middle of the ocean looking for help and rescue. But instead, we were told that this plane disappeared over the South China Sea. And then days go by and all of a sudden they go, oh, well, we had radar of this plane turning back and flying over the peninsula of Malaysia and then going to the Malacca Straits and the Andaman Sea, which is on the west coast of Malaysia. And they had been searching in the South China Sea for several days. So I thought this was very unusual. I remember vividly how no one really knew exactly where this plane disappeared, that if it crashed, where did it crash? Um, and then people uh, criticized the Malaysian government heavily for their uh, choices that they were making in terms of um, potentially doing the wrong things, not sending up jets to track the plane, the lack of information that was coming out. The families of the victims were all freaking out. Some of them were getting arrested. They were screaming in the press conferences because they knew something was wrong. They knew they were being lied to out there. So. I was never comfortable with the narrative and story that had come out. Eventually, this pilot suicide narrative began to form um, about four or five days after the plane disappeared. They said that this plane went to the Nicobar Islands, uh, Andaman Sea, and then took a sharp turn in the South Indian Ocean and flew for five or six hours to the South Indian Ocean and then supposedly crashed down there. Now. The problem I always had was, even before I saw the MH370 videos, was that the United States government had to know more about what happened to this plane than they were leading on. Because we are the most powerful nation on Earth. We've got surveillance apparatus in the sky, in the oceans, radar apparatus. It just didn't quite add up to me. So that's how I kind of got curious about the situation in general. What what organization would have been NORAD, which would have known... Um you know, the, the precise location of this craft that the United States government would have known specifically about that. I remember at the time interviewing experts who said, you know, we would we would have we would have known where these craft were at all times monitoring these 
things around the world. So is that the organization that would have been responsible? So I've learned more about our surveillance apparatus than I ever thought I would in my entire life. Uh, we have a, a satellite system called SIBRS, the Space Based Infrared System. People have actually been talking about it pretty recently now as well. Uh, we uncovered everything there was to know about this system produced by Lockheed Martin. It's essentially scanning the globe all the time. They've got six or seven Hubble Space Telescopes in geosynchronous orbit, constantly scanning the Earth as well as they've incorporated mid-Earth orbit and low Earth orbit satellites into this constellation. Uh, this is not as simple as like the movie Enemy of the State where you're just looking down through satellites anymore. They have capability to scan basically the entire planet and relay that information to ground-based computers, which can then produce what we've deduced to be like a Google uh, video playback, Google Earth video playback type situation that they have capability for, which essentially means that there's no privacy at all anymore. Now, the National Reconnaissance Office and the National Geospace Agency would be the ones that are primarily in charge of this system. Um, but we've also found stuff like the SOSA system, that Titan sub that uh, popped uh, down over in the Atlantic Ocean near the Titanic. The, we found out that there was a system there that they admitted that they had heard that Titan sub pop and they lied about it for five days while all the major news stations, remember, were talking about the oxygen and, and what have you. And that's a tiny sub that only holds four people. We're talking about a plane on the size of a city block that holds up to 300 people crashing into the ocean. That system should have heard uh, Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 crash. And there was acoustic systems as well in Diego Garcia and one off the coast of Australia that should have also heard it. But then we also found about the radar systems. So not only should four different countries have seen this plane on radar, uh, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, India and the Nicobar Islands, as well as Australia's Jorn system, which is a very advanced radar system, they all should have seen it. But then there's also three military bases, a minimum that should have seen it. There's a Cocoa Islands signals intelligence base that the plane would have flown right past. Uh, Diego Garcia military base and Pine Gap, uh, which is another American base in Australia. Both uh, have been reported to have radar capabilities that could have tracked the plane from takeoff to supposedly crashing. So to me, this is just absolute proof that the United States government knows whatever happened in this plane, they know for sure. So can you, let's rewind it a little bit here. What is the official narrative? Again, we still don't know what caused the disappearance, Correct. at least officially, right? You could go on Wikipedia, which is an awful website, but the official Wikipedia entry, right, is 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 sets out a certain narrative. Can you just give our audience at a high level wh where we currently stand with like what the official record of this crash or disappearance is? Yeah, the official report is actually they don't know what happened to this plane. And that's I don't think a lot of people realize that because the narrative that's become the prevailing narrative is this idea of a suicidal pilot. Now, the problem with the suicidal pilot narrative is there's actually no evidence whatsoever for a suicidal pilot. The officials. Where did that come out. from? Where did that come? I remember talking yeah. about this, the idea that there was there was radio back and forth and him saying something like, um, uh, goodbye. Good night, MH370. People have tried to warp that to say that he was under stress. But if you listen to it, there, there's no stress in his voice and that the officials have ruled it out. The, we traced it back to actually, I believe it was a New York Post article by Jeff Wise, which is interesting because he's also the guy who was featured on the Netflix documentary where he was vilifying Blaine Gibson, the guy who supposedly found some uh, pieces of the plane in Africa. And uh, this narrative, after he posted it out there, got legs. People started running with it. Um, but I don't think people realize that everybody has ruled that out. The officials have ruled that out. The wife supported him. The coworkers supported him. People think that there was this simulator data that was found. FBI has ruled that out. Uh, experts that actually I don't even agree with in general have ruled out the simulator data. It turns out that that was just MH150 from Kuala Lumpur to Jeddah. And he was actually scheduled to fly that route the next day. And they've gone ahead and tried to, you know, the narratives out there have tried to say that this somehow matches the route that the plane took, and it doesn't. Um, it's just somewhat similar as it goes over the Andaman Sea. Uh, and so there's a lot of misinformation out there that people have absorbed and, and kind of had now built into this narrative of this pilot suicide. But if you look at the flight path, there's no indication of suicide whatsoever. Like if you are suicidal, you just crash the plane. You don't turn the plane around when it goes dark. You don't fly to the nearest airport that you could go to to land a 777. You don't try to avoid radar flying around Indonesia. If you're suicidal, you don't care about any of these things. Um, it's pretty clearly an emergency event situation, just given the flight path alone. Maybe we just look at now, so we have the pilot, no suicide. Was there some other 
piece of this, passengers, I'm sure going through the flight manifest, the crew members, have have investigators, have you managed to pull the strings on all of the, the, the pilots, the other crew members, the, the, the passengers right. on board? Any anomalies stand out from the crew and passengers? And there are, actually. So there's two different factors that I think are certainly at play here. One is that there was two uh, fake passengers using stolen passports that changed their identity to look more like the people that, were, that they stole the passports from or they bought the passports from. They were Iranian. The story that's out there is that they were refugees that were trying to get to Amsterdam by somehow flying from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. None of it really makes any sense. This was um, admitted to uh, for about a day or two and then brushed under the rug and they never looked back at it ever again. If you have a situation where a plane is flying rogue and we don't know what happened to it, suspects number one and two should be the two fake pe people running on fake passports on the plane. I, it blows my mind that this was just ignored. Um, and then we also have 20 Freescale Semiconductor employees on board this plane, which is way too many. And these were important engineers and scientists that were on board this plane from Freescale Semiconductors. Company gets sold the next year to NXP Semiconductors. They were connected to U.S. Aerospace and Defense. We found a 2005 National Security Agency report on the com uh, commercial emergence of room temperature superconductive microchips. And Freescale Semiconductors is listed nine times through it. It even mentions that this technology relates to these microchips, which are used in quantum computers that are used for AI, et cetera, uh, could be available by 2010 or 2012, but only if the U.S. government were to invest money in it. So to me, I look at this and I go, I'm already starting to think there is an espionage angle here where we've got fake passengers running on fake passports that are spending tens of thousands of dollars uh, to fly to Beijing, which is not even on the direction to Europe. And that we've got these 20 Freescale Semiconductor employees who are all sitting next to each other, whose company should have been flagged because that's way too many people from one company on the same flight. My company only allows us to have like two or three people from the same uh, on the, hmm. the company on the same flight. And some of them even had their whole families with them. This is where I'm going. You're flying to Beijing for a week. You work for an American company. Twelve of them are Malaysian nationals. Eight of them are Chinese nationals. And you're bringing your whole family with you. It, the things it's already starting to smell a little bit rotten to me. So rotten how I guess that's where we move into the why. You know, because, okay, so we have those two Iranians acting with fake passports, and then you have all of these family members uh, of this uh, manufacturing and technology company on board. Why do you think that they were traveling together? Do you have you piece that, or is it still speculation at this point? Yeah, I think the narrative that makes the most sense, given the totality of the evidence at this point, is, as I mentioned, one of espionage. Um, that, And I think that we couldn't have figured this out w without the videos, um, because what we see happening here is potentially that we have people defecting to China with intellectual property from the American company. Perhaps China had some leverage over the eight uh, Freescale Semiconductor employees that were Chinese nationals. If you look into free, uh, to semiconductors in general, uh, you will find that the stocks of semiconductors have skyrocketed, especially over the last few years. I mean, just look at NVIDIA over the last six months. Um, right. So one big aspect of the MH370 videos is the idea of superconductivity, room temperature superconductivity. In my mind, this is the uh, fundamental requirement in order for us to achieve anti-gravity and additional advanced technology that we would consider as high science. I think that we've had it figured out for potentially decades. And this company, like Freescale Semiconductors, I think you could call Freescale Superconductors. And if this, if they had some component, like those microchips that was just mentioned, that could allow for magical technology that is essentially a uh, super weapon capability type of technology that allows you for absolute military supremacy of the planet, then the narrative here that makes the most sense is the United States government is preventing China from getting access to this technology because whoever controls this controls the world. And the idea is that these individuals were working for an American company that were somehow defecting, bringing this information to China? That's, I think, the, as hard as it is to believe, that makes the most sense. And if you go back to what we talked about right away, in terms of the weird obfuscation that happened right away about what happened with this plane and why, it seems like a cover story was being developed at that point. And one of the strongest narratives was this idea of a hijacking scenario. 
but you're old enough and maybe a lot of the audience are old enough to remember 9-11 in terms of this idea that they had a very low tech uh, hijack where uh, people stole those planes and crashed them, uh, what have you. This seemed much more complicated uh, in terms of the flight path. It was, there was, they didn't crash into any buildings that we could find. Um, it was very, it's very difficult to make a plane disappear and go dark. But if it's a state actor pulling it off, then it actually it becomes much more plausible, even though it seems more like something out of a movie. Um, but I think that the United States government, China, and potentially even Russia might have this type of, um, uh, uh, might be able to have this type of capabilities. And then it's just a question of narrowing down who our suspects are. So the re reason why we can rule out Russia, I believe, is that, and I think Jeff Wise, actually the person I just mentioned, would think that Russia actually did hijack the plane. I don't think they are quite as capable as China or the United States are in general. And we wouldn't have covered it up. Uh, you know, the United States, I think, controls the Western media. And if Russia had taken this plane, I think we would have been able to pin it on them. Um, so that's the main reason why I ruled them out. Also, there's a lot of radar systems that if this plane flew to Russia, they would have all seen them. China, the reason why I ruled China out is that they hacked the Malaysian government on March 9th, 2014. And they stole the crisis meeting minute notes of MH370 and classified information about the plane. To me, that's a strong indicator that they knew something was wrong, that they knew this plane didn't crash because they have their own satellites. And they wanted to know who took it or find out information about who took the plane. They also released satellite images a few days later that were reported in Western media as having been debris in the South China Sea. If you look at those satellite images, you're going to see three objects in a triangle formation around something else. Looks very, very similar to the MH370 videos. In my mind, that was China sending a spycraft type message to the United States, potentially saying, we saw what you did, or saying, we give up, you got us. Hmm. So, so yeah. Go ahead. yeah, mechanically then, we're... Where do we last know that we have a signal of the ship appearing? Where was the precise location where it went dark? So, and I think this will help for the audience as well, because, you know, going back, we it was very, we had no idea exactly where this plane disappeared or what happened to it. The plane was flying to the northeast from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing for about 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then it goes dark in a weak point uh, between radar systems or countries' radars in the South China Sea. And then it's being tracked by military radar, turning around, going back towards Penang Airport. Again, the closest airport that you would go to in an emergency situation by Malaysian military radar. Then it takes another turn after Penang. It doesn't land in Penang for whatever reason. We've speculated a fire event uh, happened on this plane related to 487 pounds of lithium ion batteries, very dangerous cargo to have in the forward cargo bay right next to the electronics bay. Uh, and it then, for whatever reason, it doesn't land there. It turns and goes into the Straits of Malacca. Now it deviates its, its direction a little bit, heads towards the Nicobar Islands. Now, the official or the news reports the next day or the same morning when the plane disappeared said that this plane lost contact with Subang air traffic control at 1840 UTC. They later changed this to say that the military was tracking it until about 815 or 1815 or 1822 UTC. Um, not quite at the location where they then later argued that the plane turned in the South Indian Ocean. Now, interestingly enough, at 1840 UTC, this is the time in the Nicobar Islands where they claim this plane made a sharp turn in the South Indian Ocean and then just flew for like five hours straight until it supposedly crashed down there somewhere. This is also the location of the Nicobar Islands around 1840 UTC that we've pinpointed the location of the MH370 videos happening. And there's even a witness there named Catherine T who saw a glowing orange plane at low altitude descending with smoke coming out of the back of it. And we were able to determine from this that the glowing orange uh, plane was because of uh, bromine, which is a halogen gas from a chemical reaction of the Halon 1301 fire extinguishing devices that would have been permeating throughout the plane, putting out the, the fire in the cargo bay for a little bit over an hour. This is also corroborated by a Chinese-only Mayday call that was intercepted from the Thai Thailand embassy that was supposedly from MH370 of the plane disintegrating and an attempting an emergency landing. So we have corroboration from a Mayday call that was only reported by China. We have a witness who was in a boat who saw the plane in the location where the plane supposedly turned in the South Indian Ocean. And we have two videos also corroborating the same event. 
So that precise location, again, is where all of these things converge, is over the Nicobar Islands? And the way we know this is there's actually coordinates in the MH370 satellite video. In the bottom left, you can see that it says NROL-22, which is the first National Reconnaissance Office launch of the Sibir system in 2006. The coordinates change when the perspective of the video changes. And this tells us a couple things. It tells us that we're not looking directly through a satellite. Because if we're looking through a satellite and the satellite's moving, those coordinates would be moving in real time as well. But they only move when the person moves the video screen around. Now, this is going to be consistent with if you were using like some type of Google Maps, Google Earth type situation. We were able to map that out and graph it out. And uh, I initially had assumed that maybe there was a minus sign in front of it, in which case it would have put it in the South Indian Ocean. But when we graphed it out, we found that if it was in the South Indian Ocean, the plane would have been going north into the east. And that was impossible because in both videos, the plane is turning left. And if you're going north into the east, you'd be turning right. So we were able to determine that this coordinates, the plane must be moving, flying south into the east in the videos, and the location must be the Nicobar Islands at the same location where Catherine T. saw the plane. Hmm. So now if we have that location where we last saw the plane, do we have any debris that was recovered, that's been authenticated, that this may have crashed near the Nicobar Islands? Yeah, so there is... The best debris that would argue for the Nicobar Islands location is actually a B777 fire suppression device that washes up in the Maldives that has looks like a little bomb. But if you look at it and compare it to the fire suppression devices in a B777, it's exactly the same. It's a circular metal device with tubes coming out of it. And the only way it could have washed up in the Maldives is if it was empty. If it was full, it would have sank. Uh, and this was reported on as a bomb and the Malaysian Minister of Defense went ahead and just ignored it, said they're not going to, they, it's not from the plane, it's not relevant or anything like that. There was also a bunch of islanders on another island in the Maldives that saw the plane in the early morning hours flying towards the direction of Diego Garcia military base. Uh, from the respect, uh, relative, the other debris that's been found, a lot of people say, well, they claim to have found some debris. They found a tiny, tiny amount of debris in Africa. 2,000 to 3,000 miles away from the supposed crash site. Florence DeChangi, one of the original investigators, very smart lady, I've been in contact with her. She went on Ross Colehart's uh, Reality Check podcast yesterday, actually. And she said that she had done the math on the flapperon alone. And that flapperon would have had to drift 7 to 10 miles per day in a straight line in order to get to the Reunion Islands. They did some modeling, which if you have lived through COVID, you know that modeling is complete nonsense. Um, and the first model they did of the debris drift analysis didn't put the debris anywhere near Africa. And so then they did a new one. And then they said, oh, OK, yeah, now this can explain how the flap around could get there. But nothing can describe explain how a piece of engine cowling from a Rolls Royce engine showed up in South Africa. Um, this debris should have washed up in Australia. They have the plane supposedly based on these satellite pings that they've used. Most of the experts believe these satellite pings are accurate and that we know where the plane uh, crashed. But we searched everywhere above and below water along the seventh arc and found nothing, not one piece of debris. If that location was correct, there should have been debris washing up in Australia. And it can't possibly explain how this supposed debris washed up in Africa. So then I think we can clearly say we have no evidence that it crashed. Is that safe to say? I think that you could argue that there's not enough debris to prove that the plane crashed. We also found another plane that was purchased by GA Telesis in October of 2013. It's essentially an exact replica of the plane that was scrapped 10 years or more too early. And that the flapperon was actually not connected with the unique serial number. The unique serial plate was actually missing off of the flapperon. So instead, they broke apart the flapperon and looked for part numbers. And they found a partial part serial number match. Now, I would argue that if you've got replicas of the plane out there also purchased from Malaysian Airlines, then those part numbers could be from another plane. However, the scenario that we've presented with this high technology and MH370 videos is the idea that this plane had some type of superluminal event happen. Star Trek warp drive, if you want to think of it as that. So that this plane moves from the Nicobar Islands somewhere over near the Maldives. And then at that point flies south towards Diego Garcia. And this would actually, from the drift analysis models, uh, be a better, more accurate representation of where this debris got into the water and then to wash up over there. 
Uh, and you could argue based on the fire event and the fire scenario that some debris would have fallen off this plane. You could also argue that if this plane ended up at a secret military base, that they could have disassembled it and thrown it in the water and then allowed it to wash ashore over there as well. Um, so we can't be 100% certain because we don't have two videos at the uh, location where this plane showed up. We only have two videos of it disappearing. Two videos of it disappearing. So what do you think happened to the plane? Because now we have new videos that have emerged that have been causing quite a bit of controversy. Can you take me through that and just give me you know, your, your assessment as to what do you think happened based on the people that were on board this craft and now these new videos that have emerged. Yeah, and I want to be fair as well to the skeptics and the debunkers out there as well and say that there have been several debunk attempts at these videos. And if people don't want to believe the videos to be real, it doesn't bother me at all. Um, there has been a uh, stock effect that actually I think has even convinced people like Joe Rogan and Jeremy Corbell of supposedly the zap. Uh, now, the problem with this stock effect is that they've had to manipulate the stock effect in multiple aspects in order to get it to come close to matching even a single frame from the drone video that we see. And stock what's a effect, stock effect for? Yeah, what is yeah. a stock effect for our audience? Stock effects are when you are doing visual effects and you want to save yourself some time from having to produce something from scratch. You use a stock effect and you insert it into your uh, video creation. For example, this was done in the Killing Time video game, which where the stock effect was put in exactly as it is. Uh, this was used in an Attack on Titan anime commercial, and it was also used in the movie Starship Troopers. And in none of those did they manipulate the stock effect in any way. Um, and in supposedly in these videos, there are people, the debunkers have claimed that they have manipulated the color, reshaped it, resized it, adjusted various contrasts, et cetera. And uh, that to me doesn't make any sense regarding how visual effects works. But I think it's the situation where people just have such a hard time believing that something like this could be possible, that they're willing to believe any alternative explanation that doesn't have to um, kind of make them reevaluate the worldview. Now, the other big debunk that's out there uh, is this cloud picture. So people have argued that this cloud picture uh, has the clouds in it that match the satellite video and that this proves that it must be fake in general. Now, the problem with this is that even before that cloud picture showed up, we already proved that the clouds were moving and evolving. Each frame of reference in the satellite video is only a few seconds long. So the clouds aren't moving significantly, but they're moving a little bit. They kind of evolve. You can see the edges kind of grow or, or shorten. We can see the first orb puncture a hole through one of the clouds. But the most important aspect that rules out a cloud picture is that when the zap happens in the satellite video, it actually accurately illuminates the clouds in three dimensions in the foreground and in the background. For this type of accurate illumination, you would have to build a full 3D rendered environment. You cannot use a 2D visual effect for that. So whether or not I, I'm just presenting the evidence for people that can come up with their own opinions on it. And, and later as well, I'll present the strongest evidence for why the videos are authentic. But I just want people to understand that, yes, there are some debunk attempts out there. I've refuted all of them. Um, and then what I think happened to the plane is I think that this was an espionage event where the United States government was uh, set up potentially the batteries to burn. They might have even detonated them at the specific location knowing that they do have a predictable burn rate, that it's not going to take down the airplane right away to cause a diversion of the airplane to go from the South China Sea at the location where Mike McKay sees a plane on fire from the oil rig. Nine witnesses along the coast hear loud noises the same moment Mike McKay sees the plane on fire when it first goes dark. I think that battery could have damaged the electronics bay and caused it to go dark. I also think the operatives on board the plane, those Iranians could have been related to uh, the United States military or covert operation. They could have been involved in some type of pseudo hijacking event. And the plane turns around 10 minutes later when it's turning towards Penang, the location where the pilot would go to in an emergency event. You have a, another B777 pilot that hears communication from the plane. Supposedly, there was also a tango call uh, reported by Florence DeChangi that would indicate like a hijacking event that may have happened. And there's eight fishermen at the same time, 10 minutes later, that he, see the plane flying unusually low eight different fishermen off the coast of Thailand and Malaysia. And this would be consistent with the idea that there was a fire and the pilot was depressurizing the plane, but not to asphyxiate the passengers, instead to give them enough oxygen because the fire suppression devices take the oxygen out of the plane. So you need to depressurize the plane to get more oxygen into the plane and fly low enough so that there's enough oxygen for people to be able to breathe. Because I don't know if people know this, but the passenger 
oxygen masks only last for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes at the most. So the plane is most likely being run or diverted to the rendezvous location where the assets would be prepared to perform what we see in the MH370 videos in the Nicobar Islands. I think you could also argue, like some have some have said, uh, Dan Hanley, as well as uh, Fleet, uh, Field McConnell, that potentially there is a remote control capability of the plane. The uh, French father was told that the Americans know exactly what happened to the plane, that there was two AWACS in the area. And those AWACS are these large radar planes that can supposedly hack other craft and even potentially take control of them. Uh, the capability is called the Boeing Uninterruptible Autopilot. So I think that there's a good chance that that happened at least at some point during this flight path. And it may have happened after this plane reappears somewhere over the Maldives to fly it to our remote uh, military base in Diego Garcia. So you believe it was a hijacking event, an espionage hijacking event that with a diversionary use of fire, like catching these batteries that were on board on fire. So it was a slow burn. So it would be diverted. And then when it lands, the United States government can swoop in, take whatever classified top secret information that was about to be shared and take it ourselves. Um, do you think it ever got to that point? Yeah, that's the hard part. People always ask me, well, what happened to the passengers? And I think that the event we see in the MH370 videos in the drone video, it is a cold endothermic event. So it's all black. Endothermic event means an absorption of energy. This is not an explosion that we're seeing in this video, which would indicate so this that video, actually, can you can you be precise and walk us through what we're seeing in this video, where it came from and, and how how we have this? Um, so in our drone video, we have an MQ-1C Gray Eagle. You can see the body of the drone, uh, and we can tell this is either an MQ-1C Gray Eagle or an MQ-9 Reaper. Uh, MQ-1C Gray Eagle has images that you can find in Google image search that shows aerial surveillance cameras underneath the wings. And that's the same perspective that we see in the video. Uh, we can see this in a blue uh, hue or a, a rainbow palette, as it's being called. So it's more of like a traditional thermal view, uh, slightly different than what we've seen from those forward looking infrared uh, cameras. This is a software setting in the Raytheon cameras that is available. And this may be the default settings as opposed to the black and white that we've seen from the DOD Navy videos that were declassified in 2017. Now we're watching a Boeing 777-200 that's an exact overlay of Malaysian Airlines Flight 370, which indicates that we are actually looking at Malaysian Airlines in the video. And we see it making a hard left turn. We see it descending in the videos. We can tell that we are looking at cumulus clouds. Uh, these cumulus clouds only form at low altitudes. We check the weather pattern for that day. And within 15 minutes of when we think these videos happen, the weather actually had low altitude cumulus clouds in the Nicobar Islands as well. Uh, the plane is actually maxing out the capabilities of a 777-200 wall in descent, wall turning at roughly 150 to 250 miles per hour. This would be very difficult to uh, fake. In fact, there was somebody who posted on social media claiming to be a VFX artist from the movie Top Gun Maverick that said that scaling down planes like this and, and getting it to be accurate to the capabilities of the plane is some of the hardest things to pull off. Now, what we see, both videos actually are in perfect synchronization. We have a satellite video looking from one angle, and then we have a drone video looking horizontally from a completely different angle from the opposite side. And in the drone video, we can see these orbs begin to circle around the plane. In the satellite video, we see these orbs coming in at roughly 2000 miles per hour, Mach 2, Mach 3 speeds we've estimated based on comparing pixels in them. And in both videos, these orbs are defying gravity as we know it. They're floating freely. They're not falling to the ground. But in the drone video, we see some very unusual details. We can see in the drone video that there's a black line. It looks like it's behind the orbs, but it's actually in front of the orbs, pulling them forward like they're running on train tracks. So there seems to be two different anti-gravitational effects at play here. The orbs themselves are displaced from gravity. We can see what's called the non-radiating barrier, uh, which means it's like a field around the orb. It actually looks like these are more of like ball lightning as opposed to something like a traditional flying saucer that we might expect in UFOlogy. They form a pattern around the plane that when we mapped it out, it actually is a spherical pattern mapping in the plane, rotating around in a perfect 120 degree sinusoidal pattern, which seems to have some sort of purpose, which after we see the zap becomes a lot more apparent. It's like it's mapping the plane to figure out the dimensions of it. Uh, the orbs have a heat signature in them. 
And you can see there's very clear heat signature in the orbs, which is a very unusual detail to add. Uh, engineer who works in low energy nuclear reactions, Bob Greener, has looked at this and said that this is consistent with a topological monopole. Uh, topological monopole is the idea of having a single magnetic effect, either a north or south, but not having a dipole effect. And this is potentially what might be needed in order to achieve anti-gravity, along with stuff like room temperature superconductivity. Uh, as the, the, in the drone video, and some of the strongest evidence for why this video is real is that we see it manually tracking the plane. So they're not using automatic tracking. There's a little bit of a delay consistent with somebody very far away using that camera to follow the plane and try to track it. They zoom in, there's shake in the drone video, which is as they zoom in increases accurately, just like if you're using your camera to zoom in on something, there's a 3d dynamic parallax. So when they zoom in, you can actually see the clouds, uh, kind of, you can see the edges of the clouds more. So you can actually see that this is a full 3d rendered environment. If it was fake, it can't be just a picture. Um, the, we also see that line in front of the orbs is what we refer to as a geodesic. You can imagine it like the orbs are creating space in front of them to run down, like, uh, in, as I mentioned, those train tracks, almost like a gravity well in front of them. Uh, we believe after talking to Salvatore Pius, who has uh, some patents out there that are advanced technology patents, that this could be produced by a laser effect using a high frequency uh High, some type of high frequency vibrational effect that can essentially break through the fabric of reality as we see it um, to create this geodesic kind of bending or opening up space in front of them. Uh, and then right before the zap, we see one of the strongest details is we see the orbs reorient. And they actually, in both videos, we see a synchronized event. In the drone video, we see the orbs reorient where the heat signature kind of disappears for a second and then comes back and then the orbs are seem to be in a, a very specific position at the same time in the satellite video we see the orb spinning rotation slow down a little bit and then all of a sudden the orbs converge on the plane and bob greenier has argued when they're converging on the plane they're amplifying their energy and they're and talking to salvatore Pius, he said that we can amplify energy to such a degree that we can break through the schwinger limit which is what we need to be able to do to break through the permittivity of free space itself to break through what we would see as our reality to the underlying framework of the universe itself. And then we see this cold, dark event open up and encapsulate the plane. And within three frames, a fraction of a second, the plane goes from being there to not being there anymore. You can actually see the tail of the plane in one frame, the very first frame of the dark endothermic event opening up. You can still see it sticking out of the back. And it actually, it looks like the plane's been pulled backwards a little bit. Now, I talked to Dave Rossi, who is a DOD contractor and engineer himself, and he argued the idea that there might be a fourth orb because you have to have some direction, some steering wheel for this mechanism and that there might be an entanglement effect where three orbs have been entangled to a fourth orb and you can stretch them out any two different locations. And then when we see our event go off, now all of a sudden the plane goes from being over here with the three orbs being over here where the fourth orb is as some sort of steering wheel or direction of travel. And it might be getting pulled backwards. Um, and this is speculative, of course, but if it were being pulled backwards, um, since the plane was going to the east, it would be getting pulled backwards somewhere over to the west, which is where the Maldives are. So this is, I think, the best uh, in my mind. Uh, and one additional detail that I forgot to mention is there's a heat signature in the belly of the plane as well that morphs uh, accurately, at least what I would expect from, uh, heat potentially pouring out of the plane. And it's in the location where the AC exhaust ports are near the landing gear. And since we've speculated as a fire event, especially if the fire was in the forward cargo bays, the smoke would have been pouring through the air conditioning system in the airplane. And it would be getting pumped out through those AC exhaust ports. And it, in this situation as well, we've got, you know, the fire event that we speculated, We've got that mayday call. We've got the video showing hot smoke coming out of the back of this plane as well. Uh, and then we've got our witness on the ground, Catherine T, who saw dark smoke. So to me, I think that this is a huge amount of evidence that if these videos aren't real, why do they tell a story of the plane that's matched by more evidence than anybody else's story to date, any expert or what have you? The only thing that we've had to rule out for these videos to be real and this event to be the true event of the plane is these satellite pings after the location in the Nicobar Islands. And if you look at those Immersat satellite pings, I've looked at the raw data myself. 
it amounts to 10 rows on an Excel spreadsheet. And the weirdest part is that if you look at everything up until the Nicobar Islands from when the plane took off, it's hundreds of rows of data. And you get to that part and it's just 10 rows of data for five hours. What does that mean? So the just lack of pinging back to the satellites and that therefore not entering into the spreadsheets then? Well, this is where it gets very bizarre because I've interacted with uh, pretty much all of the original experts, including uh, several people in the independent group, Victor Ilanello, as well as Mike Exner. And they just keep telling me it's normal. But the story that they present makes no sense. They argue that the ACAR system was turned off at 1707 UTC, which is 13 minutes before the plane went dark. But then we have full data from 1707 all the way up to 1840 UTC. And then at 1840 UTC, which the next ping is 1941 UTC through 2313 UTC, again, about five hours, we just have 10 rows of data. And there's a pattern in that data. And they try to argue that something changed, but I can't figure out what that might be in terms of why there would be this difference here. In my mind, if the system was turned off at 1707, the discrepancies should begin at 1707. They shouldn't begin at 1840 UTC. We looked into the SATCOMs. All the SATCOM systems that exist out there all have zero day vulnerabilities and exploits. They're all easily hackable. In fact, you probably only have to change one value in these systems in order to get people to believe that a plane went in a different direction than it actually did. For example, to convince people that it went south instead of going to the west. But the strongest evidence why those pings are not true is that we found nothing in the location where those pings supposedly say that the plane went into the South Indian Ocean. We didn't find one piece of debris down there. We found no black boxes. We had no acoustic detections, no radar detections, no witnesses, despite the fact that it's on an active shipping route. And we had 19 family members of the victims claim that they could call the cell phones of the, vic of the victims for up to four days after they went missing. One of them even proved it on television. This is Phones are not, can, you cannot connect to a phone that is turned off, that's in the middle of the ocean away from cell towers, that is underwater, that is dead. And CNN had these experts come on and say that, oh no, th this can happen, which I would believe if it was just one or two. When you have 19 families saying that, something does not add up. So they were able to call their family members' phones and they were ringing and they picked up voicemail or something like that? The part about getting to the voicemail, uh, I'm not sure about, but they they rang. And if I were to like turn my phone off and say, hey, Clayton, give me a call, you know, it's not going to ring. It's going to go directly to the voicemail as opposed to ringing. I think the counter arguments have been that, oh, well, it, it could be an international call and could ring once or twice, which again, I could I could believe it if it was just one or two. But when you've got 19 families saying that and they're saying it goes up to four days, they could do that, which is pretty consistent with how long maybe a phone would last if, you know, the battery on it. Uh, that's where I become uh, pretty skeptical in general. So, yeah. Wow. So these videos, I want to just go back to these videos, which have caused so much controversy. Sure. When did these videos emerge? We have the satellite video and then we have this drone video. Where do these come from? Yeah. And how do, were you able to link, sync? How were we able to sync them up to know that it's perhaps the same object here so we can use the exact same framing to know that this is the angle, this is the time signature, and we keep it consistent? Yeah. And this is the story of, I guess, my emergence on a social media. I never expected to be anybody in this world or anybody special. And I still don't think that I am. But uh, I remember seeing the drone video back in 2014 when I was first just curious about the plane. And I just dismissed it. I didn't know what it, I was even looking at. Just thought, oh, this is just some weird thing. And then uh, back in August, uh, these videos reemerged on the social media site Reddit, actually on the, the subreddit called UFOs. And I saw that video and I just went, huh, okay, that's interesting. And I saw the second video, which was the satellite video. And then I went, wait a minute. I remember seeing that drone video. And now you're telling me there's a second video in perfect synchronization. So I started digging into them. And, and so did many people on social media and found that, yes, these actually date back to 2014. I mean, I remember seeing them in 2014 as well, but we've got the Wayback Machine. We know that the original account uploader was somebody called Regicide Anon which technically stands for king killer, anonymous king killer. Uh, and that the satellite video, which is the first one, says received March 12th, 2014 in the description, which is four days after the plane. Four, went missing. four days, four days yeah. after. And it was uploaded 
May or published May 19th, 2014, which is roughly eight or nine weeks after the plane disappeared. So we have a time frame of between four days and 72 days. Now, the interesting part is remember those coordinates I just mentioned? Those coordinates are indicated by those Immersat pings as being potentially the real location of where the plane actually was in the Nicobar Islands. Now, the problem here is that the raw telemetry data was not made publicly available until May 28th, 2014 in a 47 page report. Before that, there was just a graph. Even Mike Exner of the independent group didn't know that the satellite information could even be real until June of 2014. So how did a supposed hoaxer know exactly where to put the plane with the real locations of the, of the, of the plane and the coordinates over a week before the raw telemetry data was even made publicly available for people that and that's were, on the screen you know, and they can see that on the screen. Yes. In the bottom left of the satellite video, you can see it in the high definition version. Um, so we also even went ahead and we looked at the, uh, we looked at all the satellites. We actually found there's a low earth orbit satellite pair, uh, NRO or, um, USA 229, a Naval Ocean Surveillance Satellite Pair that was in the right location in the uh, Straits of Malacca that could have been staring right down at this location around 1840 UTC. And this could have been in the constellation of the Sibir system. Um, in fact, the regicide and non-version is a stereoscopic version. It's two different videos side or two, yeah, two different videos side by side, slightly different angles. Now, debunkers have argued that YouTube had a capability to turn videos into 3D like that which maybe they did. But if this is actually the original version and how this was leaked out to the public, then those two satellites right next to each other staring down would have been the ones that are sending the data to the cyber system to be able to build this uh, capability that we see to track the plane in general. Um, the second video, the MQ-1C Gray Eagle video, was received, it says received June 5th, 2014 in the description, uploaded June 12th, 2014. So right away, you can start to realize that, okay, this first video came out. And then a couple of weeks later, the next video gets published. So now you're starting to build this narrative of, okay, wait a minute, like, how did these videos come out? Who potentially could have leaked them? What were they trying to accomplish in leaking them? And if you think that these videos are fake, then the su prime suspect should be Regicide Anon themselves. Because if Regicide Anon was not the faker of these videos, why would they put just received March 12th, 2014 in the description of the satellite video, because four days is not enough to come up with a whole plot plan. Four days after this plane went missing, we were still looking at the South China Sea. So there's no way the, the, the four days after is pretty much, you know, a nail in the coffin. These would have to be real. And the problem is that this, if somebody did fake these, in my mind, it could only be some type of state sponsored event. It requires far too much intricate detail stuff that was not publicly available, like the heat signatures and the orbs uh, and the monopole stuff was not even publicly available to an Alta University paper after this plane went missing. Uh, far too many details in this for us to be just some kind of rogue person that created them. So a couple of things, questions come to mind here. Why create a fire event if you have this incredible technology with an orb technology that can create spherical wraparound of the craft in order to make it disappear? Why, why the diversion? Was that yeah. part of the cover up or that's something that I've plan? been trying to figure out as well. And I think that there is uh, there was a weird letter, probably the weirdest thing that's ever happened in my whole life that appeared on YouTube. It was called Diego Garcia Whistleblower, a letter to Ashton Forbes. It showed up on an account uh, on YouTube that was created June 7th, 2024. And the video that I just mentioned was uploaded June 10th, 2024. Somebody pinged me on this roughly the next day said, have you seen this? And I read what it. year is it? <laughs> 2024. <laughs> Still. Uh, so this just so happened. June? Or sorry, January. Oh. Sorry, January. I apologize. January. Okay. Yeah. So this so just like, happened uh, maybe, a couple uh, months ago. Maybe I'm talking to you from the future and now my maybe, mind is being blown maybe. on so many levels. I don't know. Okay. So J January of 2024, right, yes. a YouTube video shows up on a channel yes. addressed to you like an open letter to you. Open letter. 11 minutes long. And I, that, up until that point, I had presented this idea that the United States government was saving this plane from an emergency fire event. Because if this plane, if it, if it tried to land in the ocean where Catherine T. saw it, it's going to rip apart in the ocean. Everybody's going to die. It's two in the morning. It's pitch black out. Uh, this is not going to be a Sully Sullenberger situation. Landing in the ocean is not like landing in the Hudson River. And there were some aspects of it that still bothered me. The idea of those fake Iranian passengers... 
Um, the idea that, I mean, would we actually save a plane in this scenario? Would we deploy that technology? Like maybe if there was a VIP on board. Um, but we knew that the Freescale Semiconductor scientists were the motive for this. And that letter actually kind of opened my eye, my mind a little bit more to the espionage events, which is, it, it argues that this is a show of force. This is a message to the Chinese government. And in fact, Joseph P. Farrell uh, found a video interview that he did on March 20th, I want to say, 2014, where he actually argued the same thing. He had deduced that this could be a message from an either non-human intelligence or from just another government that was out there. Now, the reason why he had ruled out the United States there was that he didn't see what the motive could be related to those freescale semiconductor employees. I think that if he were to go back, he would realize that that's it. But they essentially, the letter essentially argues that this was a show of force, that we were set to fire to show them that their plans were burning up, literally and metaphorically, that we knew that they were defecting months in advance and hatched this counter plan, and that we phased the plane out. We wanted China to see it going back to those satellite images that they posted so that they knew who's your daddy and that they knew that their plan would fall apart. And you might argue, well, why would China hide this? Why wouldn't China say something? I think there's two answers to that. One, nobody would believe them. You go ahead and say the United States orbed the plane you know, somewhere else and stole it. No one's going to believe some advanced, it. advanced UFO technology or something like that. Yeah. This is the highest level. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to say, I mean, these are technologies that are kept very close to the vest. And we know that different countries have access to these through other downcraft, through re reverse engineering programs of these downcraft. Uh, so this is not something that you put on the, uh, you know, put on the nightly news. Yeah, this is the type of covert kind of uh, wrangling back and forth between nation states that you don't put out there in the public. And so I think that they, A, they can't say anything. And then the second side of it is um, what's going to happen. The United States has the strongest propaganda apparatus in the entire world. If you listen to the Tucker Carlson, Vladimir Putin interview, I thought there was a very revealing aspect of that where he, Tucker Carlson asks Putin, why would you not uh, tell the world about the Nord Stream pipeline that the United States had destroyed it or their allies had destroyed it? And he says, well, it's not a cost benefit. There's not a cost uh it's cost ineffective in order to be able to try to go to a propaganda war with the United States who controls all the world's Western media. I mean, just think about it from the perspective of they got the whole world to essentially believe in this pilot suicide myth. If, if the China were to come out and say, hey, United States did this, United States is going to push back and they're going to say, no, this is misinformation, disinformation. It was China that did it or something like that. So I think that explains why they would hide it. And uh, it is a big risk for them to have filmed this on two different a uh, apparatus, surveillance apparatus, because what happens if the videos get out? What happens if one person looks at those videos and goes, wow, no one's going to ever know the truth unless I leak these videos? And that's exactly what I think happened. When we are looking at that satellite video, we can tell that they are doing a screen recording. It's not somebody who's got a camera who's filming the screen like, like I would be doing here. That's one of the earliest details that I noticed. And so when the sleuths on social media found out that this was a Citrix session logged into a database because of the mouse, the mouse is at 24 frames per second that we see in the satellite video. And it comes off the top right of the screen and goes off to the bottom left of the screen, indicating they're looking at a much larger field of view, but they're cropped it down, removing the drone so that we wouldn't see that, removing other information from it. That's when I went, holy crap. This was a U.S. military personnel who was recording this on a screen recording. They knew they were going to get caught. They have logs for Citrix sessions logging into databases like this. And they leaked this to the world, potentially because they knew the United States would never find it. And I was sitting there one day in October and I was going, wait a minute, I've got like a psychological profile for the person who would have leaked this. It would have to be a U.S. military personnel. They would be a patriot, most likely, that wants to tell the world. They remove the HUD data and all this other sensitive information. They leak the first video, thinking that maybe the world will pick up on that first video, and they don't even need to leak the second one. And then when we ignore that, they drop the second video. It's in perfect synchronization. Now you've got absolute proof. We've got coordinates. We've got two different videos. So I started Googling, looking up people. It took me about two weeks because it's really hard to find some of this information that goes back, especially seven or eight years or more. And then I run across Lieutenant Commander Edward C. Lynn. I am 99.999% sure this is the guy right away. 
every single thing. My I've got my spider senses just going off. Signals intelligence all over his every single news article about him. The strange case of Lieutenant Commander Edward C. Lynn, completely redacted information, charged with espionage, but there's no evidence he exchanged any information with anyone from China. And that was unusual to me because if you think about the person that would have leaked this, the United States government would have assumed that they're trying to help China out, especially if it's an espionage event. But then if they find out that there's no evidence of that because it was just somebody who was trying to tell the world the truth, now it gets really awkward. He was actually a Taiwanese uh, national who had been naturalized into the United States, a guy that we trusted with our military or uh, nuclear weapons. So this was a guy that by all accounts was a patriot. But the circumstantial evidence is extremely damning. He was assigned to the VPU-2 Wizards, a secret spy plane uh, program, in February of 2014, right before the plane disappeared. His lawyer is on the record saying that the investigation into him began April 2nd, 2014, the next month after the plane disappeared. And that's when I went, oh boy, like this is a very narrow window of time, but there's more. It was actually the lawyer, defense lawyer, argued that the classified information in question is available on the internet, which if it's not these videos, why were they trying to get him in life in prison for espionage? And later on, ended up forcing him to a plea deal. And in the plea deal, just for disseminating classified information, he got a nine-year sentence, which is, excuse me, huge compared to what other people for similar offenses have gotten. Most people with that kind of offense they get like a slap on the wrist or like a year. They actually had to have people testify as to what he did, why it was so damaging. Um, he was also caught with flight manifests that include search and rescue code names, which to me, this evidence piled together says this must be the guy. So I FOIA'd the FBI and NCIS. FBI wouldn't give me anything. They said it's privacy related. NCIS rejected my FOIA in total. I had the head of legal for FOIA respond back and sign the document saying it's to be kept secret in the interest of national defense or foreign policy. Now, wow. to me, I think what we're looking at here is Lockheed Martin technology. I think that we've figured out anti-gravity. I don't know if we reverse engineered it or we've dug something up and figured it out, or if we've figured this out going all the way back to the Manhattan Project and the Philadelphia experiment. Uh, but I think we've got this technology. I think that's our technology. And I think that Edward C. Lynn might not even have known. I think that he might have thought it was UFOs and thought, oh, I'm not hurting anybody by leaking this information to his Taiwanese friends who are allies with us against China, and that they pushed it onto the internet, regicide Anon gets a hold of it, then it's, once it's on the internet, that's too late. It's out there now. And so they had to obfuscate the charges against Edward C. Lin because people would have figured out that he has to be tied to MH370 somehow. So they throw a prostitution charge on there. For, for what reason? You're trying to throw him in prison for life for espionage. You're going to throw a prostitution charge out there. They yeah, you do that to just, do, they do that all the time to like just discredit people. Like, yeah. We've and the defense that. argued that. The defense actually argued that the military was playing games with the media to try to obfuscate. His family put out a website saying that this guy is a good guy and that he, should, you know, what's happening to him is uh, unfair and cruel. And I absolutely think that it is. So to me, a lot of people have heroes in the UFO disclosure realm. David Grush, Commander Fravor, Lou Elizondo, et cetera. To me, Edward C. Lynn is the hero because being a hero, it requires sacrifice. And that's what he did is he broke his NDA. He broke his oath to get that information out to the world. And he paid the price. He went to prison. He ended up getting six total years after they shaved off three years from his sentence for working with the FBI and NCIS. I think they convinced him that, hey, man, this wasn't UFOs. This was our secret technology. You just showed China. You just showed Russia. If we could figure this out from a social media account, then China and Russia's intelligence apparatus, I, I hope they figure it out. If they haven't figured it out, then they have no chance against us. Wow, you're blowing my mind. You're blowing my mind. Will he be able to speak, do you think? I mean, he's still in, he's still in prison at this point? And so this is a story I haven't told very much, but I reached out to him. We were able to find some of his contact information. One thing that I thought was very interesting is we found his Facebook profile, and he was friends with General Flynn on Facebook. General Flynn actually follows me on Twitter as well right now, who, whatever you think of General Flynn, I think that he is a truthful person and somebody is a patriot who wants the, what's the best for this country. Um, and he was the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, which he would be in the know for some pretty big secrets that are out there in general. And I think that there are warring factions in the government that want this information out and some that don't want the information out. 
I don't think that anybody really expected the disclosure to come from uh, an espionage event where we potentially stole a plane because the legal implications are huge. But I called Edward C. Lynn. I found a phone number. It rang. Somebody picked up and hung up right away, which I thought, okay, bingo. This is good. This is his phone number because he doesn't want to go to voicemail. He, you know, doesn't want to talk about it. He has a plea deal, which potentially if he talks about these videos, he would go back to prison. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, they may have convinced him that doing this was wrong and he just won't ever want to talk about it no matter what anymore, especially because right. we ignored the videos for 10 years and he went to prison and, and paid this huge price for it. So I don't want anybody to go after him. I don't want anybody to bother him. Um, I sent him text messages telling them that he is my hero because he is. I hope that one day I get to meet him in person. And I told him that I would use all my following, my, my funds, everything that I have to protect him if necessary. Um, if he wants to, I would hope that he would become a whistleblower so that he could go to maybe AARO, although I have no faith in them whatsoever. I've actually reported to have whistleblower to protection. Yeah. Yes. You know, the arrow we program need, where he could. Yeah. We would need um, Biden, which won't happen, or Trump to pardon him, I think, in order for him to be able to safely come out. And even then, I'm not sure that he would, because I do think that he's a patriot in general. Um, I got in touch with his lawyers, uh, or I called his lawyer, the law firm related to the case. And I ended up speaking to a clerk for like an hour and a half, told her everything about it. She followed me on, on Twitter after that. And then I got a weird email from them that was about, there was this law back in October about whistleblowers and it, I think related to UFO stuff. And they sent me a seminar from the week before talking about the implications of that law on people that had been court-martialed. And I thought, oh, is that a message they're sending to me? Because I basically wanted them to send me some kind of message. And then they sent me one other email that I think was somewhat unrelated a few weeks later. And that's all I ever heard from them, never heard back from them. So this is, uh, in my mind, potentially, you know, one of the biggest both conspiracies and I guess you could call it UFO videos. I mean, technically, they're unidentified flying objects in those videos. And that's why I reported this case to the AARO myself. I actually spoke to an AARO uh, officer uh, who I don't want to name because they asked me not to. And I'm still actually waiting some follow up on that because I told them, yes, I'm not a first hand witness, but I've seen videos that make me a second hand witness. And I gave them verifiable information. I said that I think Lockheed Martin has this technology. I said that you can verify that's an MQ-1C Gray Eagle drone video from an aerial surveillance package. I said you can verify that satellite video is potentially from our Sibir system that has a ground based computer system that produces it. I said you can talk to Edward Seeland and figure out what were the what is it that he leaked? We looked at his appeals and the appeal penal codes are consistent with video evidence that he potentially leaked. Um, and then <clears throat> there's one other additional aspect, which I don't feel super comfortable talking about, but I'm going to do it anyway, is that I had a uh, somebody reach out to me through uh, another contact that was found on social media that claimed that they showed these videos or they had a friend who was a nephew of a general and that nephew showed the videos to the general. And that the general took those videos very seriously, didn't laugh them off, didn't potentially think that they were VFX. And so I said, got in touch with them. They said, the only thing I have that is holding them up and talking to me is, do you think the videos are real? And I was just laughing because I'm going, I'm the guy on social media telling the world these videos are real. And this was way back in September and October. And I say, okay, what's the general's name? Joseph F. Dunford. And I go, okay, never heard of him. Look him up. Well, he was the commander of the International Security Forces from Afghanistan uh, in 2013 and 2014. He potentially could have been the guy who would have been the highest ranking military member for this operation if it was a U.S. military operation in that area. And what happened after that? He got promoted to the highest ranking military officer in the entire United States. He was the uh, he uh, reported to the president, Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Secretary of Defense until 2019 for four years under Trump. And then after that, I said, okay, well, what's he doing after that? Well, now he's on the board of directors at Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin. So I just think that how can, in my, if you look at it from my perspective, all this, as just a normal guy that I would have probably never believed any of this a year ago, all of this information, the videos, the witnesses, the evidence, all stacking up, the generals involved, the military people. How, if these videos are fake, how is all of this stuff out there? How is all this stuff line up in a way that says that these videos are real? And how do I have people like Salvatore Pius asking me to create a podcast 
so that I can talk to him about his patents, about the science. This is a guy who's an active Navy engineer, who in my opinion has seen this technology firsthand. That's how he came up with the patents. His point of putting those patents out was so that people couldn't profit off of them, so that corporate greed couldn't take control and you know, sell them for super high uh, value when it could help humanity. That's where the people who are on, I think the side that I'm on of disclosure, getting the information out there, is that we wanna help humanity. Now, the flip side of this is this technology is not just rainbows and, and unicorns. There's a very dark side to this technology. This can be turned into a weapon. And I'm not talking about nuclear weapons. This is beyond hypersonics as well. This is the type of weapon that could destroy the entire planet with a push of a button. And I think that that's the scary side of it, is that if you think about the greater picture here, in terms of this type of technology being real, is, is this the explanation for the Fermi paradox? Is this why we don't see civilizations everywhere? Because this is a discovery, a unification theory of quantum field theory and general relativity. How do you make the very small act like the very large, which is what we need to be able to teleport an object, warp speed an object. That if anybody who figures this out, any advanced civilization, potentially destroys themselves. The letter to me argues that if two warring factions got control of this technology, the world wouldn't last a day. And this is what I would ask you, Clayton, and anybody else who's out there, is that if you knew that this type of technology could be the end of the world, would you hide it or would you disclose it? I think for so many people, they would they would absolutely hide it. They would keep it totally hidden, and they would u- they would use it as a cudgel in the way that we use nuclear weapons as a cudgel, as a some sort of a deterrent. You know that we are the we have this technology, and you can't do anything about it. Um, they're not going to release this information, and they would keep it absolutely quiet. Um, I, I, and just think, I often think about how powerful it would be if we we knew that we had zero point energy available, and where people are slaving away, you know, driving two and three hours in cars on a regular basis, or oil and gas, and we're so reliant on that, or the healthcare side of the advancements that we could have to to cure cancer and remove tumors with the blink of an eye using these technologies that we know that we that we know exist and firsthand accounts of individuals who've seen these technologies in action um, but we're not allowed to have them like we're yeah we're, we're we have to remain like you know in medieval times while they're on operating on a whole other level yeah there's two different aspects of that i want to hit on here is that uh, again, I've spoken to uh, Dave Rossi, who is a DOD contractor and engineer as well. And uh, I went on Tim Pool with him as well. Um, I've interviewed him twice, once with Salvatore Pius. And I think that he and I see eye to eye in terms of how is this information kept secret? The answer is really, really easily. And you've got engineers that are going into labs, special access programs, signing NDAs when they go in, having their phones taken away so they can't be used. They see technology as essentially magic. And then they have to go out and get in their car, their gas powered car, see the pollution, see all the, the poverty, everything around them and go, how do, you, how do you reconcile these two things in their head? You have to have staff psychologists on hand so that people don't drive themselves nuts. And then they may say, well, I wanna do the right thing and get the information out there. People like Eric Weinstein would say, well, how can they hide this? People would come out and they would say something. No, they wouldn't. No, they absolutely would not. Not only are they a fear for their life, they have no benefit. Uh, look at what happens to the people that try to disclose anything like this. Look at Bob Lazar in general. The media will vilify them. The bunkers will crucify them and find any weakness in their past, any skeleton in their closet, and use it to discredit the things that they're saying out there. Um, and that's what I found is that it's not actually even hard to hide the information. It's easy to hide the information. It's too easy, in fact. And that's why the people like Salvador Pius, like my friend Dave Rossi, want to get the information out there because we've reached a point now where we're almost in a post-truth world where no one can believe anything to be real out there. And then the question is, how do you get this out there at all ever in the future? And this is where I think that it goes back to those warring factions in the government. You potentially have, I don't know exactly who's on what side, but you've got the DIA, you've got the Navy, you've got the CIA, you've got the Department of Defense, you've got the Air Force. I don't know where the lines are and who's on what side or what have you, um, but I think that they struggle with the same question I just asked you, is how do we get this out there and is it even safe to get it out there? Because what you just mentioned about the healing aspects, like we might be able to heal tumors and stuff with this type of technology and cancers. 
We might be able to have force fields or cloaking devices. We can produce over unity devices. There's only two things that you need to understand for these videos to be real. There's an extra dimension, an underlying construct to our reality that we don't perceive. And if we can tap into that, we can tap into the negative entropy of the universe itself. And then you also need to understand that space is not empty. And if space is not empty, then you can create over unity devices. You can cheat the laws of thermodynamics by opening your system up and you can borrow energy from the vacuum of the zero point energy to produce a system that puts more energy out than is put into it. This allows for free energy. We can also use superconductivity and super powerful magnetic fields to create fusion power. Now, the problem, like I said, though, is that you can then, like we saw in those videos, when the orbs are converging to amplify the energy, as Salvatore Pius's high frequency gravitational wave generator patent says, amplify energy to such a degree where you can destroy a planetoid or asteroid. Scale that up and now you can destroy a planet. Scale it up further and you can destroy a sun. We might even be able to create a big bang with this type of technology. So it's extremely dark, which leads to the one question I wanted to ask you uh, is, what do you think the nature of the UFO phenomenon is? I remember you talking with Tucker Carlson and you mm -hmm. guys talking, and it still sticks in my head every single day, pretty much about the idea of this phenomenon being so dark that it's scary to talk to your family about. My family won't even talk to me about this type of stuff. And I think about that technology and I think that, wow, that's, that's really, really dark. And then I also think about the idea that there could be some type of spiritual aspect to it or some type of dark, uh, reality that we don't want to face. Yeah. Dark demonic reality, a, de a dark demonic beings. Um, the, the information that I've been have discussed with, um, with individuals and sources and I think a lot of the darkness that I'm bothered by, I think Tucker as well, and I don't want to speak for him on, on this, um, but he's talked, he's also kind of followed up and talked more about this sort of the interdimensionality and also the idea of the demonic side of things. But I think he and I are in agreement about the use of some of this technology for really nefarious purposes. Human beings using this technology, there's a lot of ideas that, oh, these are all aliens. No, no, no. It's humans using this technology that we got from them and that we've been using it for really terrible things uh, that a lot of a lot of NGOs have been using it for really terrible things. I'm talking child trafficking, human organ harvesting. And we have firsthand accounts, of course, you know this, of members of the military coming stumbling across this and actually interacting with this uh, high level members of the military involved and have witnessed this as well. Human organ trafficking. Um, uh, the caring of human beings and moving them using this technology. So you think about using these craft to transport clandestinely children, human beings, body parts, organs for the purposes of harvesting, scientific study, manipulation. Um, uh, we, we see this absolutely all the time in, in war zones and we see this in uh, natural disaster phenomenon. This is where you know, where people, a lot of people end up going, dis, you know, disappearing. Uh, we've certainly seen it in, uh, in Ukraine during the Ukraine war. So that to me is the, uh, one piece of it that I would say is the stuff I, I don't really want to talk about with my family. It's, you know, my, when my son talks to me about UFOs and wants to hear more about it at 13, the last thing I want to talk to him about is that human beings are using this to harvest uh, or to take children or move, you know, move them around the world and sell them off for trafficking purposes or that sort of thing. So uh, that's one big piece of the darkness, I would say. The demonic side of it is another big piece of this. And uh, you know, some of the warring factions between these, these different species that are, that are out there that, that I can't wrap my head around. Uh, and I've certainly heard that from different sources as well. But to me, the Human use of this technology has been the hardest and the, the, the most difficult pill to swallow, that they would be using it for such terrible and dark things rather than helping humanity. I guess that's the darkness that I speak about. I, I think I agree with that in general. I think that we're our own worst enemy when it comes to this type of technology. I think I've independently concluded that most of the stuff that we see out there as UFOs is most likely just us at this point that we've figured it out. Maybe China and Russia have. We've had seen all these cases of drones that are incurring over our military bases. I would argue that that might be Russia and China with this type of technology. And um, I think as my friend who I've met now, Jake Chansley, people know him as the shaman on January 6th. Um, he's a very introspective guy. And he would say that 
you know, we might as well get this out there because the worst people in the world already have access to it. It can't get any worse right. on that from that perspective. From the UFOlogy people that I've spoken to, very prominent people in general, they would say that our fate is up to us. Whether or not we destroy ourselves with the, or not with this technology, that's up to us as humans to figure that out. I look at this technology and I see the hope in it in terms of ending poverty, uh, ending homelessness, ending hunger around the planet with this type of technology. Um, and that's the reason why I am on the side of the information coming out in general. But I think that we do have to put safeguards in place because the problem with this technology is figuring out a unification theory of the forces is that it's a Pandora's box. Once you open that Pandora's box up, you get everything that comes along with it. Even Eric Weinstein mentioned this on Jesse Michael's podcast with Hal Pudoff, is that you can't just pick and choose what things you want. If you want the medical healing aspects, well, you also get the weapons that come along with it. So this is, I think, the, the dichotomy, the issue that we face as a civilization. This is what my goal is in revealing and talking about this with you and other people as well, is I want to move the conversation forward. Everybody I see in UFOlogy is talking about the different types of species and uh, you know what they want to do with the species and what these crash retrievals mean, et cetera. I want to talk about what does the technology mean? What does it mean for our future? And how do we avoid obliterating yourself and oblivion in general? Right. Yeah. And the healthcare part of it is most fascinating to me. I just had a friend who lost a, a relative to, uh, to cancer. I have, you know, I have multiple friends over the years that have died of cancer. And if we, this technology exists and we have access to it, that we can literally eradicate cancer with the blink of an eye. But we're so concerned about biopharmaceutical companies making massive billions of dollars that we don't, and we keep this information quiet, uh, is one of the worst to me, that's one of the worst tragedies of, of all time. So that's where I come from on this. So, well, Ashton, I, I, I don't want to take up any more of your time. We've uh, it's been covered a fun so much ground. Yeah, it's been amazing. And I'm just, you're, you're, you've blown my mind on multiple levels. Um, I'd love for you to be able to come back. I'd love for people, sure. you know, as obviously as this story evolves, we get more information on this. We're able to hear perhaps from uh, from um, Mr. Lin himself and be able to, uh, you know, to be able to have whistleblower protection. I mean, who knows how, where the story goes um, in the future and uh, to be able to have this and, and to answer some questions from, you know, skeptics out there. Um, so if anyone has any questions about this, please drop a comment below. Uh, and Ashton is very, um, you're great at being on social media and I'd love for you to jump into the comments thread here in this video. Um, and to be able to communicate with individuals if they have any questions about it. So uh, I'll let you uh, just get you out of here on this, Dash. Where, where do you hope the story goes from here? What's the next step in this story for you? Yeah, so for me, uh, I've been very transparent about what my plan is. And my plan here is to make this information self-evident. I don't think that the government or the media can, mainstream media, can ever talk about this because the more they, if they were to ever talk about it, people are going to start to figure out that the stories out there don't make any sense and that as hard as this is to believe, people will start to wake up to that. And there's going to be a huge amount of liability related to it. So my goal, and I think I've already accomplished it to some degree, has been to get this story out there into the zeitgeist. So that when people talk about MH370, they talk about that guy that talked about those videos and all the evidence regarding those videos that are out there. I think the reality is we're not ready for this. I think that this situation and the implications of it are so big and so dark that it would actually break people's minds. If this information is true and the technology is real, it's not just a socioeconomic change as well. It's the idea that we've been getting lied to for our entire lives. And I think that will actually break people's minds. So I think that what really needs to happen is we need to raise our collective conscious to the point where we can understand that we may actually have anti-gravitational technology. Maybe there are aliens out there. I'm not really sure. Um, so that's my objective. Uh, if you guys follow me on social media, at JustXAshton on Twitter, on YouTube, and potentially maybe on TikTok in the future, although I'm not looking forward to it. That's the kind of conversations you're going to see from me, exposing the truth, exposing the lies that are out there and showing people that high technology is already out there. We don't actually have to discover it. It's been discovered. We just need to talk about it. Hmm. Hallelujah. Ashton, it's been a great pleasure having you here on Redacted. Thank you so much. Thank you, Clayton.